For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. <clears throat> Today we want to look at the reason behind the cross, behind the sacrifice. And to get that started, I'd like to take you back to the beginning. Uh, not necessarily the beginning of everything, but the beginning of you. There was a time when uh, my wife and I, we wanted to start a family very badly, and we could not. <clears throat> and we prayed, and prayed, and in that prayer we said this, we would say, Lord, we have so much love to give. Father, we have so much love to give. I want to assure you this day that before you were born, God loved you. God loved you so much before you even got here. His plan, His hope, His desire is to have all of His people as one and with Him. That is His plan. Our issue is that sin gets in the way. It creates distance between us and the Lord. Sin also gives the devil an opportunity. It gives the devil an opportunity to lie to us. And uh, if we continue to sin and things become overwhelming to us, the, the results of those sins become overwhelming to us, we spend time and time again in that we begin to believe the lie that he gives to us. If we are consumed with guilt, uh, we've been talking about this in, um, or this concept at least, in the uh, addictions class that a person will only act on, a, on what they believe. <clears throat> and so if I get consumed with guilt, what I start to believe is that I am a bad person. Now, it's not the, the things that I have done is bad, but I get to thinking things like, I've just done too much. And I begin to believe that I am bad at my core. And if I believe this, I will assume, and this is heartbreaking, but it is true, I will assume that forgiveness is not possible. My biggest fear will become being judged uh, because I don't want you to tell me what kind of a person I've become because thank you, I know, I know who I am, I know what I've become, thank you very much, I don't need to hear it from you. And so if my fear becomes being judged, the way I will act is I will push away people. It will start with people and it will end with God. I will push God away. I will become someone. The way I will act is I will become someone that tries to balance their sin problem by themselves. They're going to deal with their sin on their own. I will become someone who follows the rules very strictly. But when it comes to giving my sin over to the Lord, I just won't do that. Uh, something may happen and I will want forgiveness for it. Uh, I will sin. I will want forgiveness, but I'll have to have good time. Okay, so what I mean by that is, well, I can't pray to the Lord to take away my sins. What I need to do is I need to be good for two or three days. And then maybe I can bring my sin to the Lord uh, then maybe I can do that, uh, maybe two or three days, maybe a week, maybe a month. And then I can pray to God and God will take away my sin. The belt of truth, the thing that we should beginning, begin our day with is that only God takes away sin. And each Christian should start their day off in that, in that manner. But if I am overcome with guilt, I will try to do it on my own. 
The next thing, the next lie that I begin to believe is shame. If I continue to sin and do these things that I'm very embarrassed of and I'm not really sure even why I'm doing them, I will start to believe that, um, that there is something wrong with me, that um, I'm too dirty, that God can't touch me or deal with me in order to forgive me. So the thing that I start to assume is that God is ashamed of me. And uh, if I believe this, then what I will do is my biggest fear becomes exposure. I don't want to be exposed for what I really am. If you knew, I'm going to show you the side of me that I want you to see. I don't want you to see the real me. If you knew the real me, you wouldn't like me. So the, the fear becomes exposure, so I become what I do in this life, is I become someone that lies, I become someone that covers up and that hides. I mean, it's truly Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, right? Uh, I, I try to push it off on somebody else. Uh, my life will be coming unraveled, but my Facebook account will look amazing. If we begin to feel this way, we need to look at the Bible to get us back on track. Hebrews 12 and 2. So ever looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising its shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, well, long story short, you are the joy that was set before him. He did not want to be counted with the transgressors. If you saw someone on the cross, you would know they were guilty. You wouldn't even have to look and see what they did or ask somebody. It was just, These people are guilty. He would be, his death would be counted in among with the thieves and the murderers and the Lord, our Lord, Christ, our sacrifice, could handle it. He could handle it for you. He could handle it to get all of us together. He could handle it to begin to get you back with the Lord where you belong. 2 Corinthians 7 and 10 tells us, Godly sorrow produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly sorrow produces death. Now, <clears throat> That little without regret, when I first got into this deal, uh, when I came back to Christ and I was looking at this verse, I thought it was one of those things, that whole without regret. I thought it was like I'm really sad about being caught, not necessarily I'm sad for doing the thing, but that's not what this is about. You can have a salvation without regret. This is salvation without guilt and salvation without shame. You know, we talk so much about the old man being put to death, you know, and our job and our responsibility to do, 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 you know, it's like we, we talk about that and we talk about that, but truly, when the old man is put to death, the deeds that were with that old man are gone, you know? <clears throat> The good thing is the Bible is crystal clear, it's crystal clear on how God wants us to view ourselves. Colossians 1, 21 and 22 tells us, And you, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him the greatest relationship in the history of history, and you are reconciled to it. The child of God is reconciled to it through his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Now, do you believe that? Do you believe that God truly loves you that much? 
not the person sitting next to you, but you. Don't push it off on someone else. Do you believe that, that God loves you, that Christ gave His life for you to make you holy and blameless and above reproach before Him? Listen, when I got into this deal, when I came back into this deal, uh, this deal of, of, of God, of Jesus, I believed in the virgin birth. I believe that he left his heavenly home and died on the cross and was, was raised from the dead. I believe that he ascended into heaven and, and, is, and is waiting to come back for us. But when it came to being holy and blameless and above reproach, I fell short. I just... What I had done was I had bought into a lie that was straight from the devil. And I have disrespected the blood of Christ. There's John 4, 9 and 10. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world, that we might live through Him. That we might live through Him. Now, some people will say that this is life, that, that this is the eternal life that we talk about. Yeah, yes, it, it is. It, John 10.10 10 tells us that, uh, that he has come to give us abundant life too. And, and this is not just the life and the afterlife, but this is here now. That his sacrifice takes away our sins, takes away the guilt, takes away the shame. And it's like, I'm down with it. How do I do it, man? I, I need to interact with my Bible. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. I've got to read and I've got to, I've got to pray. And if, and if I'm not doing that, I'm missing out on the best thing that this whole world has to offer. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation of our sins. It's like this is love at its core. How much more love do you want that someone that would give everything for you and then I would turn around and hang on to the worst parts of myself and torture myself over the things that I've done in the past. And that's not, that's not what this is about. This is about so you can be with your brothers and sisters in Christ and you can be with God. And there's, there's no room for that past life with God. If we are... Looking at the cross, it's like, how should a Christian believe? What, what should a Christian do? True godly sorrow. True godly sorrow. <clears throat> the Christian must believe that I am loved unconditionally. That's what the Christian should believe. Now, I'm not saying that you can go out there, do whatever you want, and God just loves it. I'm saying that 1 John 1.9 tells us if we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we come to God, if we confess, He is going to forgive and He's going to cleanse. It's, it's gone. You don't have to worry about it anymore. I believe that I am loved unconditionally. And my assumption has to be that God always loves. God always forgives. My only fear becomes loss of, uh, loss of fellowship with God. Now let me tell you something. If my fear, if I believe these things and uh, people only act on the way they believe, and if my fear is loss of fellowship with God, then I will interact with my Bible. And I will pray. Because I do not want to lose the most important thing on this entire earth. I do not want to lose it. I will do that. I become somebody that changes their way of thinking and repentance, real repentance, not shallow repentance, but real repentance comes into my life. Now. Back in the day, I used to believe this was all well and good. This was good for, was good for Kyle. This is good for Josh. This is good for Jonathan over there. But when it came to me, I had this prayer. 
And it was, uh, God, show me you love me. I understand how immature that is because my presence on this earth with you is a testimony to God's patience and love. It, it truly is. It truly is. But anyway, here we were. Okay? And it, and it, it hit me. It dawned on me. Um, that every day, every first day of the week, we come together. And the Lord says, let me show you the unleavened bread that represents the body of my son. His flesh that he gave for you that was striped. This man who never did anything wrong was beaten. He was pierced. And his sacrifice was perfect for you because he loves you so incredibly much. I want you to see I want you to see the fruit of the vine that represents the blood of the covenant, right? It represents the blood of the promise, the assurance of our very salvation between us and the Lord, the most the most important thing. The most important thing between us and the Lord and God and us to have us together as a congregation to have us together as his people Together as one and with Him. Loved before. Loved before we were even born. Remember this blood that... That the Lord of Heaven left His heavenly home for you. For me. Please consider these things as we partake.